All right, thank you very much. And I see we're recording. So we'll call this <laughs> meeting to order for Wednesday, May 19th, 2021. And this meeting is being recorded. All votes will be taken via roll call. And in attendance from the select board is myself, David Phil, Jane Nevin Smith, Joyce Chunglo, John Muscovitz, and Amy Parsons. And uh, first order of business is public comments. And we're gonna limit this to 15 minutes. Please limit your comments to three minutes each so that others may speak. And when called on, uh, just state your name and uh, your residence for Hadley residence. Um, if anybody's here for public comments, uh, turn your camera on, wave ass. I see a Marianne Parker is the first person I, first hand I saw. So go ahead. Hi, thank you for, uh, for permitting us to speak to this. Um, so I support um, the town of Hadley opting out of the state of Massachusetts mosquito control program, um, utilizing aerial spraying to control mosquito populations. I am uh, supportive of the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's efforts to protect um, the public from mosquito-borne diseases like EEE. Um, we do, I do not think, however, um, that extensive aerial broadcasting, uh, broadcast spraying is the right technique um, for prevention and management of localized disease outbreaks. Um, the spray that they use, Anvil 10 plus 10, and other similar pesticides are toxic and land um, to land dwelling and water dwelling uh, um, living things and including invertebrates and dragonflies and beetles and fish. Um, I support the Massachusetts Department's uh, public health plan for management of mosquito-borne uh, diseases. The DPH plan calls for limited use of pesticides based on the le levels of mosquitoes and disease activity in a specific location. Um, I also really think that the most important thing is to increase our monitoring of mosquitoes and mosquito-borne diseases. Public education is going to be really important here. Personal protection of mosquito bites, um, elimination of mosquito breeding sites, um, and targeted applications of pesticides when necessary. Although I'd like to hope that we don't have to go there if we. That is three minutes. I have muted, muted Marion. Okay. And uh, Marion, are you a Hadley resident? I did. I Okay, I, I saw a yes. And okay, next, uh, Shell, I, that's the next hand I see. Go ahead. Hi, um, Shell Horowitz, 16 Barstow Lane. I see this as an issue of personal liberty, among other things, and also economic benefit to opt out of the state's program. On the personal liberty side, I think. Hadley residents should have the right not to breathe toxic pesticides sprayed indiscriminately from the air or from a truck. And, you know, you can think of it similar to the, the need to, the, the desire to be free of wearing a mask in situations where one is not required. It's, uh, if anything, I think having toxics enter your lungs should be a, a, even a higher claim of liberty than that. Um, and there are alternative methods of mosquito control. Nobody loves mosquitoes. I don't think you'll find anybody here who, who will love mosquitoes. But there, there are other ways of doing this. This is an extreme step for a non-extreme problem right now. And also, I do want to point out, Chairman Phil, that you said 15 minutes for public comment. But when Carolyn sent out the notice, it was a half an hour. Uh, incorrect. Uh, we, this is not a public forum at this point. This is. Uh, our usual 15, I'm looking at the agenda right here and what was posted on board docs and it says right there, 15 minutes. So I'm not sure what you saw, but um, Carolyn and Mike looking at the right thing. Sorry, I'd have to look how, to see how I wrote that. I'd have to look back on how I replied. Okay. Uh, Shell, are you done with your comments or are you, okay. All right. 
Uh, she's looking at that. Uh, Susan Garrett, that's the next hand I saw. Thank you. I'm Susan Garrett. I live at Five Lorena Lane, and um, I would I would really strongly urge uh, the Select Board and Board of Health to opt out of this um, plan of Dr. of <laughs> Governor Baker to to do widespread spraying. Um, first of all, we have a really low incidence of EEE, but even if we did have an incidence, um, this isn't the way to do it. It's it's just a crazy idea. There are many scientists who've been looking at this and who, um, you know what, if all of us, when we go outside, where do we see the mosquito? They're hanging out under the foliage and then they dart out and bite us, right? Um, they're not they're not hanging out in the air where the aerial spraying happens, but other, other things are. And so as other speakers have said, we're talking about toxic pesticides here that they would be spraying. Um, whether it's aerial spraying or truck spraying, that stuff spreads. I live in a little neighborhood with lots of children and um, people of all ages. I don't think people want to have um, toxic stuff coming into their backyards. I have um, an organic garden, vegetable garden. I don't want pesticides coming. I'm sure no one wants to breathe them. In fact, you know, they can affect, you know, they, they, we have an, we have an insect apocalypse going on now. I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but um, it, it just look at your windshields. You don't have bugs on your windshields anymore because we've been killing all the insects. The insects are an important part of the whole the whole system, right? Um, birds, invertebrates, everything. We need bugs. Um, maybe we don't like mosquitoes, but um, you know there are other. If if we come up against a terrible public health crisis, we can use larvicides to kill the larva. We can just remove standing water. There are many many things to do. So I'm not going to go on because I'm sure other people want to talk. But I really really hope that for the sake of everyone's health and for the environment that um, you do opt out. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Shell, I did look at the uh, posting from the clerk's office. It was posted for a 15 minute public comment session, uh, just FYI. Um, all right, next please. Uh, Michael Doctor, go ahead. Sorry, I'm not very Zoom literate, I guess. That's okay. Uh, Michael Doctor, 113 Bay Road. Um, I'm a farmer in Hadley, um, and I urge you to opt out. I'm an organic farmer. There are a number of organic farms that depend on their livelihood for agriculture in this town. And if we are sprayed by mistake, we're out of business. And it's, it's that simple. We, we, we can no longer sell our product as organic. Um, and so this is really a, a major threat to us. And it's something we're really concerned about. Most of us organic farmers have opted out every year. We send in a, a map of our land and tell the state, please don't spray this. We're organic farmers. Mistakes happen. I would feel a whole lot safer living in Hadley as a farmer if the town opted out, I'd feel a whole lot safer as a human being in Hadley if they didn't spray toxic pesticides to control a bug. You know, as a farmer, we are well versed at using non toxic controls to deal with insects, to deal with pests, to deal with disease and weeds. And, um, you know, if we can do it to produce food, we can do it to keep people from getting EEE and keep people from getting West Nile virus. You know, the, these, there are other ways of dealing with it. People can, can dress accordingly and keep their screens closed and wear bug repellent if they want to do that or not. If they don't, it's a personal choice thing, as Shell said. Um, so that's my two cents. It's a little bit more valuable than two cents to me, though. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, yeah, I see Deborah Levinson. Myself, thank you. Uh, I want to emphasize tonight that opting out, as I see it, is really about opting into a better approach for mosquito control. As a community with many farms and home gardens and natural areas, 
<clears throat> I think Hadley should be a leader on environmental matters. Um, aerial spraying of toxic chemicals endangers our most vulnerable residents, as well as agricultural and other outdoor workers. Um, but also not only them, but also our food supplies, water, animals, pollinators, and other insects, potentially upsetting a critical ecological balance that keeps Hadley uh, healthy and whole. Regarding effectiveness, aerial spraying, as I understand it, is at best a last resort. If and when all other methods of control fail and are necessary, spraying could be considered but spraying targets adult mosquitoes and only those that happen to be in the line of fire at the time of spraying. Uh, repeated sprayings are often necessary then as new adults mature. The approach called integrated pest management is a better choice. It's a long-term solution, not just a quick fix. It's more effective, it's less risky to public and environmental health, and it is recommended by both the United States Center for Disease Control and the EPA. It involves a multi-pronged approach, including public education, surveillance, <clears throat> and mitigation at an early stage of the mosquito life cycle. Um, with this approach, we can identify high breeding areas and either eliminate the source or apply larvicide, larvicides to those targets before the mosquitoes even hatch. I, so I urge the select board to opt us out of the aerial spraying program and <clears throat> put our attention and resources toward developing a comprehensive plan that prioritizes public health and the long-term health of the environment. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Anybody else? Uh, Michelle? Yeah, I'd also uh, advocate for us opting out. There are a lot of organizations that are opposed to sort of blanket spring. One of them is Mass Audubon. I'd also like to point out that the Massachusetts Department of Public Health is not an advocate of blank, blanket aerial spring. They um, prefer to use an arsenal of other um, things like public education, personal protection, and also, I wanted to point out that we don't have a really robust monitoring system in this state to track um, mosquito-borne disease. So we really don't know till a case comes up. So we could use more sentinel tracking. Um, another thing I wanted to point out too, well, one is pollinators are at risk in the state and this harms invertebrates. So we're really um, endangering agriculture. Um, and the ecosystem at the same time. Um, the other thing to think about is the watershed because I'm a member of the Friends of Lake Warner and we and other groups that concern ourselves with water quality are concerned about things going downstream into the watershed, into the lakes, rivers and ponds and invertebrates are susceptible to being killed. We have enough problems trying to support the wildlife that should be there, that's threatened from all sorts of um, nutrient overloads and other and pollutants. And this would just add to that problem. David? Yes. Um, Greg Mishizan, can the Board of Health uh, speak for a moment? Yeah, let me just, uh, end, that'll end our public comments. And now we'll move on to uh, 3.1 aerial mosquito spraying. And uh, there's a whole bunch of attachments in here uh, for the public if they'd like to look in board docs. But uh, otherwise, yes, Dr. Mulder, go ahead. Uh, Greg, is, Greg is on, he's gonna speak. Greg, go ahead. Okay, David, uh, I'd just like to tell you guys that on May 4th, the Board of Health discussed opting out of aerial mosquito spraying and we voted three to nothing in favor of recommending this opt-out option. Uh, a little bit of background, Triple E outbreaks occur every 10 or 20 years, 10 to 20 years. Each outbreak lasts approximately two to three years. Um, the most recent outbreak started in the summer of 2019. There were 12 cases in the state in 2019 six deaths, 
In 2020, there were five cases in the state, none in Hampshire County. Um, Tripoli infection goes back and forth between infected birds and mosquitoes. Humans get the virus from the bite of an infected mosquito. Humans don't pass on the virus. They're not contagious. Many mammals can get the virus from the bite of an infected mosquito, not just humans, but infected mammals do not lead to human infection. So Hadley is a member of this Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. Um, this district is trying, but is somewhat underfunded, so they're not able to test accurately the mosquito population. So our reasoning in recommending that we opt out was the incidence of Tripoli in Hampshire County is quite low. We can take steps to lower our own personal risk by taking precautions to avoid mosquito bites. Um, use mosquito repellent when you're outdoors. Wear long sleeves and pants and socks when appropriate. And remove your own areas of standing water on your property. So we're recommending that the, the town opt out of this program and the Board of Health is willing to work on an alternative to aerial spraying with the community if you would task us with doing that. That's it. Okay. And uh, so, Carolyn, do you want to give us a little bit of background of what the process is here if we were to choose to opt out? I know you've been talking to uh, Senator Comerford's office and whatnot. Yeah, you, there is a plan. Um, and I did talk to some area town administrators as well. There is a, a plan that Greg just referred to. Uh, it's a lengthy application. Uh, it can be done, but we would have to do it by the 28th, I think. Is that the deadline, Greg? Yeah. yeah. We so, the deadline extended from its initial date. Right. They did extend it. Extend it. Uh, so there is, you would have to have that plan sent and approved. Um, I have that letter. So I'm just looking to see who it gets sent to EEA -E opt out. Yeah. So that would have to be filled out and sent. Um, but it, the, the plan is, it, it was a little confusing. I couldn't get anybody from the state to call me back. Um, it's a little confusing as to uh, what's the minimum. It looked like minimum, the minimum plan was education um, and outreach. Uh, but when, once you got into the application, it became much more complicated. So. You know, it, I did get a, a variety of information um, from different sources, like the town administrator um, in, in area towns. Some are opting in, some are opting out. Uh, and then uh, I talked to Senator Comerford's two staff members who explained um, about mosquito spraying in general, and uh, that this was an initiative that Senator Comerford um, put a bill on last year for the opt-out ability. Hey, David. Yeah, I'm good. Um, I've been following it for a few years. And when we decided on the testing pro process uh, with UMass, I know they're underfunded for testing right now, but I've been following it on the uh, water side, the drinking water side, uh, Narragansett Bay, out east near Cape Cod, where they've had quite a few horses uh, come down with this disease and pass away. They actually sprayed pretty close to the drinking water, surface water supply out east, and they tested the water through the water system uh, on the outfalls. And they, the spraying today is so accurate that that minimal uh, overspray go into the drinking water supply with the wetlands all around it. Anybody else? Select word. John, is that, are you talking about the larvicide or the adulticide? The larvicide, I believe, is what they spray, uh, you know, around bodies of water or in areas where they, where the mosquitoes are reproducing. Exactly. Most of it was tidal water, I believe. Right. When, when, they, when they do aerial spraying, they use uh, different, they use yeah. adulticides, which are the toxic chemicals that we're talking about here yeah. or that people have mentioned. 
Yeah, I, I tried to get it together for today, but I couldn't find it. I, I read it last fall, actually, because I think that's when they did it. Uh, and I don't even remember. I know Narragansett Bay did it down in Rhode Island. And, uh, and I know they just did it out east. I, we had a seminar for uh, water continuing education credits. And, and one of the people had spoke about it that was actually against it. And then she was for it. So, you know, it, it's, it's a tough decision to make. I mean, this is a last ditch effort. So if we ever had to do something on a spur of a moment last second, then this would be an option for us, you know? So in 19, uh, 2018, we joined the Pioneer Valley Com uh, Mosquito Control Commission and paid them $5,000. What does that give us? Yeah, and they were supposed to test and then they ran out of funding. And I don't even know, they, they were doing all the testing up at UMass, but I don't know if they're still doing it right now or not with COVID and everything going on. So I don't know what they're actually doing, but I can tell you that that was something that was championed by the Board of Health in 2018, because I remember the town meeting wore an article to join the Mosquito Control District. Yeah. And part of that uh, plan, if you look at their website, is in the last ditch effort, uh, like somebody mentioned, if the adult mosquitoes are out of control, then to use the uh, judicious use of, of aerial spraying. And that's part of their, if you go to the, the uh, website, the state website, you can see all the various mosquito control districts and what their plan is. So, but what they're actually doing, I'm not sure. Okay, but that's as a last result when the problem is severe. I, I haven't heard any data that there's a problem in Hampshire County. And I'm hearing a lot of kickback from people who are concerned for the other pollinators in the area, for the organic farmers for the birds who eat the bugs and for the humans who breathe the fumes. So I think we should assume that Pioneer Valley uh, Mosquito Commission has the alternative plan. We're a member of that board and we should opt out. The Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control Commission or uh, district is uh, part of their plan is spraying. If you look on their website, uh, their mosquito control plan calls for larvicides, adult sides, aerial spraying, vehicle spraying, backpack spraying as, as needed. When there is an issue. Correct. We don't have an issue. And that's what oh. the state, that's what the state's doing too. The state's not going to just go out there and start blasting, you know, millions of dollars worth of chemicals. They're talking about doing it when there's an issue. You know, the, the non-organic farmers have been spraying produce now since they came out with spray uh they're there's they're really regulated they they too have to have continuing education credits when they spray uh th there's farmers that use it all year long all right so what are we going to do raise your hand no, we're not, we're not taking more public comments, sorry. She's Board of Health. No, I was talking, Michael Doctor had a, a hand up, so. Uh, she's on the board, of, she's the Board of Health. No, no, Margaret. I was talking about somebody else. I didn't see uh, Margaret's hand, Margaret, go ahead. So I just want to get some clarity around this. Um, so the Board of Health is against it. The people on this meeting uh, also voiced their opposition to it. Uh, where does that leave the select board if the Board of Health and the people on this committee, uh, on this meeting, uh, also opt out? Not sure what your question is. If the people on the call opt out? I don't know where the select board stands on this. I didn't get that. Could you try again? I, I was um, contemplating what I've been wanting to say or to do. Um, it's not that we wouldn't want to follow what the board has health has said. Um, this originally, when we opted into the Pioneer Valley uh, for the spraying or 
this program, um, it was a town meeting vote. Um, so we did not, as a select board, actually make the sole um, um, movement. Yes, you have people on tonight that are definitely against any type of spraying. Um, I have talked to others, uh, which really has not affected them, of course, because they're not organic. Um, and I also have talked to, you know, we've talked to other farmers and things about their animals and whatnot, and it has not affected them also. So it's not necessarily what I would think that we should do. I think, um, again, this is a hard decision because uh, it originally was voted on at town meeting. So is it something that we bring back to town meeting in the fall? Um, do we, what do we do for the time being? Suspend it um, until we have a, a firmer vote in the fall. Um, we have not sprayed. I know growing up as a child, um, we sprayed every summer. I grew up in Northampton. My family had a 300 acre farm in Whateley um, and everybody was sprayed um, every year because the, the mosquitoes were so thick. Um, I don't recall anybody really having any more repercussions than they did with other pesticides that they did. Well, I'm 72 years old, so you can imagine what kind of pesticides they used back when I was a kid. Um, and actually, you know, that wasn't anything that uh, was a detriment to my family. But again, you don't know how other families were affected by it. So, you know, I'm not sure if we just need to bring this back to town meeting. Uh, and not vote on this at, at most. Right now, all we have that have um, spoken tonight are people that are against it. And I do appreciate the Board of Health and their decision. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to um, interfere with how the Board of Health uh, would like to do this. And if they're going to take the reins and do alternative um, things, because it's not going to come from the select board. So as I feel, so if, if you, the select, if the board of health would like to take this part over and under their um, wings, then, you know, I'm all for that. I think the board of health, this is Greg Mish speaking for the board of health. I think we're willing to do that. It, when we talked about this, we felt that the frequency of the infections is minimal. There are plenty of alternatives out there. And even if it's just paperwork uh, and filing stuff, we're willing to do that. We think it's that important to opt out. So I'll make a mo motion behind Joyce's suggestion that we turn this over to the Board of Health to make the paperwork and basically opt out of the spring. And if we need to, we can take it to town meeting in the fall. I want it on the agenda in the fall at town meeting. I want uh, other people heard beside other people that have spoken tonight. I think that's only fair. It's, we have uh, a minority more or less compared to the amount of people that live here in town and others that do farming here in town. We have both sides. Um, so I think it would be only fair that we would bring it back to the fall town meeting um, to ask the general um, public people that participate in town meeting what they think. Okay, I'll make that part of that motion. Okay, I'll second. All right, motion by Jane, second by Joyce. Any other discussion on this? All right, Jennifer, roll call. Oh, I had a quick question. Sorry, it took me a second to unmute it. So if we're pushing this to fall town meeting, um, is, the, is there or is there not a decision that we have to make for this mosquito season? Correct. We have to opt out by the 28th. Is that right? Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so we voted in on this in 18. So it's been three years. We've never had to spray. I don't see any reason to opt out of it right now. And if you want to bring it back to town meeting, then absolutely we can do that. You know, I, I missed you yesterday, Michael. I was going to have this discussion with you and I seen you down the barn and you disappeared, but I have talked to other farmers and like I said, they, they don't have a problem with, with the correct spring, you know, it's, it's not like it. I mean, I'm a farmer, like we have, we have over a thousand animals, so we haven't had any issues or seen any thing. And I haven't, I would, I mean, I would have heard too from other farmers being 
who I am um, and I haven't, but um, so I just have a, so the current motion on the table is to send this to fall town meeting, but that doesn't change what we need to do for this year or do we, if we do no, nothing, then we're just continued opted in. No, no I, the motion the was to opt out, give it to the board of health to write the paperwork and take it to fall town meeting. So opt out for this season and then uh, go to town meeting and, and revote it in the fall. And the board of health would do Okay, and that would be for the, and that would be, so we're, opting out for this year we're deciding for the whole town right now to opt out for this year and then we're taking it to fall town meeting for next year and letting everyone decide for next year is that yes right? correct. correct if we want to okay. remain in that type of program and we haven't had we've been opted in since 2018 and we haven't sprayed is that right that, that's the point i made you know but is this is okay. opt out opt out of everything for good or is this opt out just for this season this for this summer season i'm saying to opt out just for this summer season that's well, how i read it is this well, summer what did you say? I, I i specifically didn't see that in there you know you mass you mass tests mosquitoes they test birds they test uh ticks they test anything you can send over there still and uh you know I, I don't know how involved so many people are but i know i know some people that sent the things over and a lot of them died of triple e you know the birds did so you know i don't i don't maybe it won't be an issue ever but we, we've already got proof that that it is here in a minimal amount all right, um, anything else before we vote? David, can I just, I, I guess I need two clarifications. What if, what motion, what are you asking to put on in the fall? And two, um, I don't think the participation in the Pioneer Valley uh, Mosquito Control Program okay. has anything to do whether opting in or out. The testing part is, will still be there. Yes, so I, it sounded like you guys were mixing the two. Right. So the, those are two separate things. So can you clarify what you're what you want to postpone until the special town meeting? So the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, I believe is the name of it, is on their website or on the state website. Part of their control plan is testing, larvicide, adult side spraying as needed, backpack aerial vehicle spraying. So we voted in 2018, actually the town meeting overwhelmingly voted to join that mosquito control mm -hmm. district. Right. Spraying is a possibility to control these mosquitoes. Uh, what Jane's motion is, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jane, was to opt out for this year, which would mean that the Board of Health would submit the paperwork for the opt out process to the state. Mm -hmm. and, and we would put this on the town meeting warrant for special town meeting in the fall and let the voters decide if they would like to get out of the mosquito control district and you know, where spraying isn't an option anymore. Because well, right now that, that mosquito district spraying is an option. If we opt out, it doesn't necessarily take us out of the district and they no. still continue to no. test. No. So I don't think that the question of getting out of the Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control Commission is part of that question. The question is, specifically about spraying and how the town as a whole feels about it as opposed to a smaller group that we're seeing tonight. I understand now, thank you. Okay, last question, Jennifer. <laughs> Real call the Phil? No. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungaloo? Yes. Was Kevin? No. And Parsons. No. That's three two. Thank you. And just for the public that would like to opt out, they can opt out their own land, their own farms, their own property, just like they've been allowed to do each each year. 
Yeah. You know, you, do you still want to make a motion to turn this over to the Board of Health now and bring it back to the town meeting? Because uh, there's obviously going to be a lot more discussion about this down the road here, obviously. Yeah, if you want to make that motion to put it on a uh, fall town meeting to um, not participate in any spraying or whatnot, then make that motion. I'll make, I'll make that motion to put it on fall town meeting for whether to opt in for spraying or not. I'll second. All right. Any discussion mm -hmm. on that? Jennifer? I just wanted to say that I, like, that was why I voted no. I just felt like it was kind of down to the wire. And I felt like the whole town didn't have an opportunity to vote on it again. So that's why I voted no to that. Exactly. So that's I think if something happens this year and it's not a dry year again, and uh, we do need to do something, you know, I, I hate to opt out and then end up having some trouble here. You know? and, yeah, and I understand that too. I was torn between the two. Um, giving people the opportunity like i said it was originated at town meeting and i feel like um, they should also have the opportunity and just a small amount of people um, to make that option so that's why i went the way i did tonight okay um jennifer no call that field yes nevin smith yes Trungalo? yes Kevitz? yes Carson. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next we have annual town meeting public forum. And uh, Jennifer is gonna share a PowerPoint, I believe. Maybe. There we go. And we're not doing questions and answers on this, correct? Uh, we, we usually do as part of the forum. So if people have questions, they just can't advocate for or against anything. Okay. So this isn't going to be any big discussion here tonight on 27 articles. Mm, usually it's not. It could be, but usually it's not. Uh, I won't be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it's early still, Joyce. Oh, I've been up since 4.30, so not early for me. All right. Go for it. Let's go. Jennifer, can you make that bigger? Or wait a minute. Maybe it's my screen. I apologize. There we go. No, it's small. Huh. Well, that's fine. We'll just go off of that. All right. Um, so this is the annual town meeting warrant review public forum. Uh, the town meeting is the 22nd at 1 p.m. at the Hopkins Athletic Fields. It will be outside. So I will, um, I'll, on behalf of Randy, I will say, bring your umbrella, bring your uh, water, bring your chairs, bring, just be ready. We're gonna try to do this outside rather than put people inside. And uh, should have done it. Say that again, Jane. And sunscreen. Oh, you know, yeah. list of things to pack. Yep. Uh, the fire department is buying water, ice, that kind of stuff. So hopefully, just like last time, we'll have plenty of fluids to hydrate people with. Um, it looks like it's going to be warm, just like last year, though. So, all right. Could I get the next slide? Did I freeze? I think Jennifer froze. I, I'm <laughs> frozen. Can you Is you the hear PowerPoint? Me? The PowerPoint's frozen. Uh, yeah, I see the the first screen, the first slide. Can I get the next one? Is that my computer or Jennifer yours? Can y'all hear me? Yeah, I can. Hear I can you. hear you. Yeah. Okay, so apparently my desktop is freezing. I think that there's something going on with the Wi-Fi. So if y'all give me just a second, I'm going to switch to a laptop. I'm a little bit dismayed that we're starting at one o'clock. I want you all to know that. 
while, while we're waiting for that, Randy, do you want to say anything about the uh, town meeting while we're waiting? Oh, um, I can't say much about anything except it's going to be hopefully just like last year. We'll make it through without getting uh, rained on. It's supposed to be in the 80s again, but cloudy. So it should be a feel a little bit cooler. Um, as David said, just bring be prepared for anything. And hopefully the weather will cooperate and we can get this meeting done in on Saturday. And that'll be that. All right. Looks like she's coming back. There we go. That looks better. I'm unmuted. Y'all all heard me say whoop. I'm sorry. I'm going to mute. All right. All right. Can you give me the next one? I think it's worked. There we go. All right. So the intent of this, for those just listening, um, what's happening here? There we go. Okay. Uh, is to provide voters with an overview uh, and context for annual town meeting, improve voters' understanding of warrant articles, and offer voters an opportunity to ask questions. Um, next one. The forum is not intended to take a vote, favorable or unfavorable, provide any group or individual the opportunity to advocate for a particular article or to speak against any particular article. All right, and here's the, the ground rules here. All participants will be muted at all times unless they've been called on by the select board. Uh, to ask a question, please raise your hand, wave at us, just let us know that you're out there. Um, all participants uh, wishing to speak have to identify themselves and uh, identify any professional affiliations that you may have that impact your comments. Uh, please limit your comments to three minutes so that others may have a chance to speak and time limits are strictly enforced to allow everyone an opportunity to speak. Be considerate of other speakers, whether you agree or disagree, and refrain from commenting out of turn. Any person showing disrespect to those speaking, uh, well, they'll be muted. So <laughs> easy enough. Um, and I think next is the uh, consent agenda. Carolyn, go ahead. Okay. Grace, I, I'm Grace. Joyce, I'm going to go quickly through just each topic on the consent agenda. Please have patience. I just want to explain a little bit about each one. Uh, so the consent agenda, the select board, the finance committee, and the moderator identify articles that generate no controverse, contra controversy, need no debate, and can be properly voted by consent. But at town meeting, if someone wants one taken out, they can. So uh, article number six is grants and gifts. This allows the town to accept grants and gifts throughout the fiscal year. So the town meeting does not need to be called when we receive grants and gifts. This is purely administrative. Article seven, chapter 90 of the consent agenda. This is the chapter 90 program. Presently, we receive about 365 roughly um, from the state each year to help maintain our roads and bridges. This gives the town authority to spend this money. The short-term borrowing, this gives the treasurer the authority to borrow within the fiscal year in anticipation of funds. If we do not have the cash available, we haven't had to do this, but it's a good safeguard in case we ever needed to. Uh, the fund balance transfer, this was affectionately called by David Nixon, the sweep article, and basically uh, cleaning, up for a pro uh, cleaning up the money left over from a project that's already been completed or it's no longer needed. And we transfer the leftover balance to its original source. And this gives us the opportunity to reduce uh, borrowing authorization. Number 10 is the water treatment uh, plant filtration membrane. And every year at town meeting, Hadley, uh, transfers $26,000 from the water reserve fund to pay the 10 year down payment on the water, water filtration membrane units over at the water treatment plant. Uh, so that when the filters are needed to be replaced, you will have that amount of money. Number 11 is uh, again, uh, strictly administrative at CPA. It's $3,000, which are administrative costs to help the CPA do um, any miscellaneous expenses they have throughout the year and the set aside of 10% of CPA funds for th the three purposes that are required by law. 
Article 19 is CPA, CPA extensions. These projects need more time to complete. Um, and this extends the sunset provision on those projects. And number 27, the moderator term is the present term for the moderator is one year. And this would be extending that term to three years. So the next one. Everybody comment on that picture. Jennifer loved that picture. It makes her happy every time she sees it. So this is the um, Emergency Rental Assistance Program for COVID-19. And this program provides temporary rental relief to Hadley at residents who have experienced negative economic impact as a direct result of COVID-19 and are unable to meet rent obligations. To qualify, an applicant would need to meet several requirements, including proof of residency, below 100% of the area medium income, hardship proof, and need. And I, I'm, I can't tell is, if Dylan is on, if anyone has any questions. Dylan, if you wanted to add to that. Yeah, uh, feel free to answer any questions that anyone has. Uh, representing the Hadley Housing Economic Development Committee um, with this article. Um, and this is re response to um, started this off last year and it's been continued. Uh, the eviction moratorium at that time was December 31st of 2020. Uh, it's uh, since been pushed off. It is now June 30th. Um, we did have a stopgap measure um, put together to provide rental assistance um, in the last four or five months. Uh, we saw zero successful applications come through that program, um, but the program administer uh, uh, Community Action Pioneer Valley, CAPB, uh, said that they saw a drop off in other local area programs like East Hamptons and Amherst uh, due to uh, additional finance or uh, federal stimulus money, as well as tax returns coming in. Uh, CAPB did suggest that we should keep it um, as the eviction moratorium coming up might impact uh, rental need here in a couple, couple of weeks. Um, and we will, uh, right now it's written to have a hundred thousand ask for the CPA. Uh, we are going to make an amendment that'll drop that to 25,000, uh, in recognition of the, uh, lack of successful applications coming through, but then also, uh, to make sure that the program is in place and ready, uh, in the event that we do see an uptick with the eviction moratorium. And, uh, Andy Morris Friedman has a hand up. Um, <clears throat> taking my question. Um, this is a confusing article because of the history uh, that you just went into. The original 50,000 that was set aside by the select board is being returned to the select board. Is that uh, correct? That is correct. We had a sunset clause built in there. It will be returned to the uh, Hadley Affordable Housing Trust Fund that uh, was set up. Okay. And, um, um, uh, how much are the uh, administrative costs? Uh, the CAPV has a 12% 12, 12 administration fee. Um, that is below the target that we were uh, told to go after by the select board. Uh, and it's also lower than Amherst's fee that they negotiated uh, and in line with East Hampton's fee. CAPV, uh, by adding us as the third town that they were managing, was able to uh, kind of drop that cost for us and we saw those savings. Okay, and that so percent is only on administered funds. Okay, so it's not 12% of the 25,000, it's 12% of the money that's given out as grants. That is correct. We don't pay anyone until someone is successfully approved in the work. Okay, but my final question is, does the CPA committee know that you're going to make this amendment? Uh, I believe Molly was in touch, uh, or I know, Randy has his hand up. You might have more information. Thank you for taking my questions. Okay, so I'll speak. Um, the CPA does know what's going on. They had an emergency meeting last night and voted in favor of this twenty uh, reduction to $25,000. And, <clears throat> excuse me, Dylan mentioned an amendment to it. Rather than do that on the floor, what I'm going to do is uh, read the article as $25,000, explain that there's been a quote unquote friendly amendment made because the uh, article 
uh, the, the warrant was closed before the CPA fund could, could make a vote on this. So rather than uh, lengthen the process, we'll start off that way. That's great news. Okay. Any last questions on article one? I don't see any other hands or anybody else waving at me. So I think we can move to the next one. Okay. The next is a CPA cemetery request and the Community Preservation Act Committee presents the following requests. 60,000 for gravestone restoration and preservation at North Hadley Cemetery. 30,000 for gravestone restoration and preservation at North Hadley Cemetery and 65,000 for the replacing of a historic stone fence at Hockenham Cemetery. And if there's any questions, I know Amy is here and I'm not sure if Al Weinberg is here, but um, if you have any questions, one of those could provide more information. What's the difference between one and two? Besides $30,000. Where it's at. They both say North Hadley Cemetery. Oh, I'm sorry. You said one and two. That's yes. a typo on Jennifer's part, getting carried away because I love North Hadley that much. One in Plainville, right? Yes. <laughs> this is why we do this. Thank you, Jane. Who is the other cemetery? Plainville. Plainville. Thank you. All right. Any questions on Article 2 before we move on? Plainville is the one on Mount Warner Road towards the UMass thing. Which one is which? Plainville is Mount Warner. No, which, which article? Which, yeah. which number is which cemetery? The uh, 60 or the 30? Jennifer, two is Plainville. I think one is North Hadley because it needs more work. Yes. So two will be Plainville. Correct. And let me correct that and say it's Russellville. Russellville Cemetery, not Plainville. So Russellville up by the Sunderland line. Yes, North Hadley Cemetery, Russellville Cemetery, and then the fence at Hockenham. Okay, so that's the one by the Sunderland line on Route 47 then. Yep. I really have North Hadley on the brain. That one's still in North Hadley. All right, last call for Article 2. Any questions? No? All right. Article three and article four are zoning bylaw definitions and zoning bylaw amendment, the fees in lieu of affordable housing prevention. And I'm, uh, I think that Jim Maximoski is on as well as Bill Dwyer, if they would like to go into um, some more detail on that. There we go. Um, the, the zone bylaw definitions will take for the most part, there is bylaw, there's definitions throughout the zoning bylaw. And this will consolidate them into, into one single section so that they'll be a lot easier to uh, find. And it'll, instead of searching throughout various sections when you wanna look for something, it'll also define some definitions that are not currently defined that, uh, that are in the bylaw. So at town meeting, will you read every definition in the change or just the overviewing change and how it's going to happen? Would you repeat that one again, please? Randy knows what I'm asking. Yeah, he'll be ruled out of order, Jane. Thank you. I will be happy to move to waive the reading of the article. Oh, wonderful. Can I, Thank you. Can I make a suggestion that uh, tonight, these articles are available uh, and that people that are coming to town meeting, I would suggest that they review these articles before they come to town meeting so that they know what the amendments are and what the changes are uh, bylaws. Absolutely, because it's going to be hot and uncomfortable out there. So let's... Uh, yeah. If they have any questions, email uh, our administration and she can get them the right person to get the right answers before town meeting. Any questions on article three and four for planning board articles? You I'll didn't see. talk about article four, David. Oh, I'm sorry, article three. All right, next. 
Article four, I'll take over as moderator here, I guess. Jimmy, can you talk to us about article four? One four? Yeah. On these, the, uh, we have a affordable oh, housing oh. provision. We have an affordable housing provision in the zoning bylaw where if you build more than six residences um, or senior housings or whatever it may be, you need to provide for an affordable housing unit, either rented or purchased, depending on however it's being built, or you could put it someplace else in town. Um, at last, at the two town meetings, at the annual town meeting last year, we instituted the Affordable Housing Trust, which is a, a fund to basically address building affordable housings or in one, some shape or form. This provision of the bylaw or amendment will allow a third option for the developer to put a fee into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, rather than putting something on their property or someplace else in town, um, but is an option. If they still think the fee is too high or they, whatever it may be, they can still build it themselves and regulate it themselves as long as they are in accordance with the Affordable Housing Trust. Okay, any questions on four? I don't see anybody waving at me, so let's keep going. Okay, number five is the Stretch Energy Building Code. The Green Communities Program requires that the town adopt Stretch Energy Code as one of five criteria for green communities, the green communities designation and access to grant funding. And I, I think I saw Mark Rabinsky on the call and I think Tommy as well might be here. So if and you have questions. Good evening. Mark, I think I saw Jack here. So if either either one of you want to talk. Yeah, about I could it. give a, a, a rundown of it too. So um, I'm Mark Rubinsky. I'm the uh, Commonwealth, Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, Western Regional Coordinator for the Green Communities Program. So uh, Hadley is pursuing the Green Communities designation. Green Communities Division provides grants, technical assistance and support for municipalities to reduce energy use. If Hadley were to achieve all five criteria of Green Communities designation, it would be awarded an initial designation grant of 130,000 to be used on energy conservation measures. Uh, and once it has completed that grant, it would also be eligible to apply for competitive grants. Presently, 80% of communities in Massachusetts are green communities. Uh, to qualify as a green community within the state, the town or city needs to meet all five criteria. And one of these criteria is to minimize life cycle costs of all new construction. Presently, Massachusetts gives communities two options for their building energy code. The first one is a base energy code. And the second one is an optional stretch energy code. So the stretch energy code was developed in response to a call for improved building efficiency. So to meet criteria five of the green communities designation, a, a community must adopt the stretch energy code as the, the, the code for the town. The stretch code can be adopted by the governing body. In this case for Hadley, it would be um, a town meeting. And it can also be rescinded through town meeting too. So once you've adopted it, you could also rescind it, um, though you wouldn't be a green community anymore. And of our 291 communities that have adopted the stretch code, none of them have rescinded it. The stretch code, it's important to note that the stretch code only applies to new uh, residential construction, new commercial buildings greater than 100,000 square feet or greater than 40,000 square feet if they're considered high energy users. Um, that's sort of the, the rundown of it and I'm available for any questions if anybody has any. Jack uh, had his hand up, Jack. Yeah, David, Randy, can Mark speak to this uh, warrant item at town meeting? You know, he's not a, a Hadley citizen. Yes, he will be able to, uh, one of the, uh, uh, thing issues that are granted with the consent agenda is for people to speak uh, like Mark. So Does permission need to be requested? Uh, residents and somebody like that. Yeah, so he, he okay. should be allowed to speak without any problem. Okay, so I won't have to request permission. He can just go for it. Great. I'll, I'll look at the 
the way the consent agenda is worded. And if it becomes an issue, I, I'm, we can get him to speak. I, I don't see an issue with that. And at town meeting, you'll also uh, reveal the votes. It was recommended unanimously by the select board and recommended unanimously by the finance committee. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that was just a simple majority to let someone speak from out of town, wasn't it, Randy? I believe so, John. Yeah. Okay, any questions on Article 5? Uh, Tommy, go ahead. Yes, I just, <clears throat> Mark, is it, so is it 290 present municipalities that are in it out of 351? Uh, Southwick, I was just there last night, voted. It's 291 now. Out of out of the 351, so um, I'm hoping Hadley will be 292 on Saturday. Okay, thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions, so let's keep going. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay, it's the revolving funds, and uh, I'll just address the ones that are going to have some changes done. There are, are a list of others. And, but these we will be dissolving. Uh, it's the electrical inspection line item, the Russell School and the after school program. That's all because Russell School and the after school program, Russell School, we are not leasing um, for usage for that building anymore. So there's no need to have a revolving fund. The after school program, uh, we are no longer, the Parks and Rec Department is no longer participating in that with the schools and we used to be reimbursed for helping to coordinate that. And the electrical inspection uh, will be functioning the same way as the, the other inspection services. Um, they, and they do not use a revolving fund. Um, and so about 75,000 of uh, the total of all of those that's left in the revolving funds for those is 75,000 and that will be returned to the general fund. Any questions? I don't see anybody waving. Let's keep going. Okay, the Department of Public Works requests funding for $160,000 for three emergency water projects. Uh, Mount Warner tree removal is 20,000. Mount Holyoke electrical alarm system is 100,000. Knightley Road culvert head wall repair is 40,000. And we do have some pictures and I'm gonna ask Chris if you wanna explain what those projects are, Chris Okafar. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, the, uh, let me begin with Mount Warner. Mount Warner we have a, is a, one, of, one of the locations where we have uh, our water storage tanks. And uh, currently we have an easement to the tanks. But for some reason, uh, we, we've not been able to maintain the easements in the past. So therefore, align a lot of big trees. So our so DEP has, in their annual inspection, uh, one of the things they want us to take care of ASAP is making sure we have access, also making sure that we have fence. We've done the fencing. So we are requesting for funds to take care of these trees and also, in because of the nature of the trees, and we have our main pipes going on going there, and these are aged old pipes. One of the ways to take out these trees, uh, why the cost is that level, is because um, we attempt to minimize uh, the um, vibration uh, because we, apart from the roots. The pipes, uh, uh, each old pipes, we don't want any interference. So, but this, we are, that's where we have that uh, amount, where we are requesting such amount for tree removal, is to have an access easement. And hopefully, uh, we will maintain the easement whereby no more trees in that area. Okay. The, other, the other project is um, Mount Holyoke. Mount Holyoke is also, uh, uh, we have a storage water tank. It's located along Lawrence Plain Road. Now in this situation, it's a very, it's a big emergency because uh, the electrical, the electrical power source, um, we're just uh, managing one, um, one leg of that electrical power source because the power has failed. And so we are in a situation where we, 
if we don't do anything right now, uh, we may not be able to communicate with the water tank. Now, the so our request for money is to rewire the lines from Lawrence Plain Road into up into the mountains where we have the water tanks. And also to bring it, this will also give us opportunity to bring it up to code. When the current situation has lasted very long, at the time it was put in, uh, the construction was different than today. So we have all these big wire uh, cables, but they weren't encased in any any sleeve or what we call um, plastic pipes or any, any pipe. So there was no covering other than they were put in the ground. And with time and age and chemical reactions, uh, it's, it has impacted on the wires. So that's, uh, and also created um, this disconnect, disconnection between the water plant and the tank. So that's uh, number two. The third one is also an emergency for us. It's a covert on Nightly Road. It's been, it's been there for some time now. Uh, we had to go to conservation. And uh, recently, uh, we were with, the last time we were before them was April the 13th. And so the conservation has given us a go ahead with a couple of conditions. And so we are, that's, that's what brought us to that 40,000. But we're thinking that if the conditions can be reduced, we believe that the amount to fix the head wall will be reduced. We are asking because we don't want the cover to be damaged. At this point right now, it's very exposed to the elements. And um, we hopefully, with fixing of the head wall, it will stabilize uh, the, the road in that location. Those are the three main projects we are asking for funds at this time. Any questions on Article 13 on these three projects for Chris? I don't see any. All right, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Oops. David, Andy Morris Freeman has his hand raised. Oh, I missed it. Andy, go ahead. Thank you for taking my question. Chris, on the Mount Warner tree removal, do you know the number of trees that are going to be removed? We, um, we, I don't have exact number because uh, we uh, tend to do some of them in-house, but I could get that number to you if um, we have a lot of big trees, which are anywhere from 18 to 24 inch diameter. But uh, we, that's what we anticipate the contractor to do for us. But I could get you exact number as soon as uh, now that we are at this level where the select board and the finance committee has uh, weighed in into the issue. So if you don't mind, sometime tomorrow, I'll be able to do that to email. Uh, well, I, I think so long as you have the answer by town meeting, I think that'll be okay. okay. People are gonna wanna know tree cutting can be a little sensitive sometimes. You know? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, I don't see any. Okay, keep going. Okay, I'm going to introduce two representatives from uh, Woodard and Curran, uh, an engineering firm that has been working with the town staff um, regarding the levy for some time. And um, I know that Rich Niles is here. Rich, I, I don't know if Scott's here as well. Is it just you tonight? Uh, it's just me. Scott. Come okay, on. Rich did a great uh, uh, presentation a couple of weeks ago, so we asked him to come back and explain that, explain the assessment study. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, thanks for having me and allowing me to participate in your meeting. Um, do you have the uh, two-page fact sheet, Carolyn, um, or do you want me to pull that up and share my screen? Well, it's between you and Jennifer, whoever does it first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can do it. Okay, great. Um, okay. All right, so I'm, I'm going to just do a quick overview. Um, this is available to the public. Um, it provides some background regarding the, the town's flood protection system. Um, many of you may be familiar with this, and so I'm not going to go through all the details because um, you can read a lot of this, and it provides some good background about past studies, 
um, and some of the needs. <clears throat> but we have uh, a levy. So you guys have a levy system that uh, protects against the hundred year flood event along the Connecticut river that runs um, South um, and then intersects with um, route nine and uh, actually ties into the rail trail. So the rail trail actually serves to provide flood protection. So if you can see on my screen here, the blue shaded area is what would flood during um, a hundred year flood event, which FEMA, the federal emergency management agency has mapped. So properties that fall within that need to obtain flood insurance properties that are within what we call the protected area of this levy system um, do not need to obtain flood insurance if they have a federally backed mortgage. So um, th this system provides a value to the community, certainly economically um, for recreation, because a lot of people walk along the top of it. Um, it's a nice walk along the Connecticut river. I've done it many times. Um, and the rail trail is, is a scenic um, popular area to, um, and so what we've been doing with the town over the last several years is a phased approach to evaluate the status condition and maintenance needs of the system. And we're looking at it with respect to FEMA's criteria, which are really strict. This system was built back in the 19, late 1920s. Um, and, and for the most part, it it's, it's, uh, meets most of those design standards. There are some it does not meet, and there's some areas where we recommended improvements. Um, some of these are very minor, uh, animal burrows, some drainage improvements, um, but there's more significant issues regarding uh, stability. And it's not to say that it's unsafe. It doesn't meet certain criteria that FEMA specifies for their current design standards. And so we, what, we, what we're recommending to the town is that you look at what it would take the cost to remediate that and what other options does the town have to look at improving flood protection and, and looking at what's the most economical or, or most um, uh, you know, cost-effective recommendation um, to pursue for capital. So some of the things can be done and, and, and Chris and DPW um, has some items that he can address as part of routine maintenance. Um, there are some improvements that would be fairly significant capital costs. So we want, we're recommending that, that the town do uh, further analysis to look at the economic impact. Um, to do that, we need to do a bit of a feasibility study and come up with some costs for the current system. But in past discussions with the town, we identified an opportunity to look at an alternative to upgrading the rail trail berm, and which would still be a capital cost, but it could provide significant benefit. The problem is we don't know if it's really feasible at this time due to uh, environmental constraints. Is it uh, really the most economical decision? But it would pr provide a lot more flood protection for the downtown area. So this is just a snapshot of what is being protected in terms of building value um, in, in these two zones. So this is the current zone, which is what's protected now. It's about 113 structures. And if you were to construct a new levy here, um, it would protect an additional 196 structures. And these are things that are bigger than a shed. Um, and some of those structures are significant gas stations, um, you know, uh, municipal critical infrastructure like pump stations. Um, so, so we need more information. We need to do um, uh, engagement with agencies. We need to do engagement with the public to evaluate whether this is feasible. Constructing a new levy system is no small undertaking. And we want to make sure that that makes economic sense. And it may not. So the outcome of, of the next steps and study could be um, you do minimal maintenance or you do, you do the maintenance you need to do. You don't invest heavily in, in remediation at this time, or you invest in some remediation and an alternative that proves to be um, a significant benefit to the community. So the, the steps that we're recommending, and this is, this is what happens with these programs quite often is you take a stepwise approach because we need more information, engage with the public um, to determine whether it's worthwhile to move forward. And so um, before the, the community expends significant capital funds to do so. Um, and so these were the next steps that we recommended were to um, evaluate the cost to upgrade the existing system um, to meet design standards, conduct additional inspections. And this one's a really basic thing. This should be done periodically, no matter what. So this is kind of part of routine maintenance, but there's some detailed inspections that engineers do regarding uh, scour along the river. So we got to get in a boat. We got to send cameras through the pipes 
look for certain you know potential defects. Um, so this is just part of sort of routine work that we're recommending that you do since it's been um, several years since that's occurred. Um, engaging with the public and, and agencies um, to evaluate the feasibility. There will be environmental impact associated with this. These are this is a significant system that would um, you know require a lot of disturbance, um, and so we want to make sure that that's feasible from an environmental permitting standpoint and that it will be acceptable to the agency. So we're, there's an engagement process there that we're recommending. And then looking at the cost benefit of a new levy. So really doing an economic impact analysis to see if we were to, instead of investing in the rail trail, which would be a difficult task because it's owned by DCR, um, does it make more sense to divert that money to a system that provides more protection? So, so we're really at a conceptual level here and we need more detailed information and cost to determine whether it makes sense to move forward with that. So this is a stepwise process. And then one of the more most basic things, uh, there's no real detailed uh, operation and maintenance plan. Um, you know, the town has been doing maintenance on, on the system, but there's uh, a level be above and beyond that that needs to be included in, in a, um, what we call kind of a, a operations plan um, that also includes procedures for how to respond during floods, how to coordinate with other agencies, et cetera. And that's a pretty basic thing. So, so that's what's included in this article for um, the tasks. And, and that um, I think is probably my timeline. <laughs> so hopefully that is helpful. Any questions on this article? Last call. All right, and you are going to be at the meeting, right, to speak about this, Rich? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yep. So I look, look forward to seeing you on Saturday. And will that handout be available for the public? Yep, it's already Great. printed. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you, Rich. Okay. All right, let's keep moving. All right. So the Finance Committee will be presenting the final versions of the general fund and enterprise fund budgets at the annual town meeting. It's been a lengthy process of meetings and negotiations with the select board, the town administrator and department heads. Although the town experienced a drop in local revenues during COVID impacting both FY20 and FY21, we will have over 500K in replacement revenue funding from ARPA, which is the American Rescue Plan of 2021. This will allow our town departments to maintain a level of service budget for FY22 in the hope and expectation that revenues will return to previously levels by FY23. And so, uh, so some of the points to highlight is that um, there were no employee uh, layoffs. Uh, we were able to do a 1.5% COLA increase for the employees. There was no re significant reduction in services. Uh, the town employees did not set stand standing job this year am amongst COVID. And for the second year in a row, uh, we did have to delay contributions to our OPEB fund. We pres preserved sufficient free cash for paybacks to stabilization accounts in the fall. And we did maintain a AAA bond rating. Amy, did you want to speak about this at all in finance committee perspective? Well, I would, but Carolyn did such a fabulous job that I think she's hit about everything. So I would have to, the only thing I would other, you know, say is that we do have a budget um, that is recommended for both the, from the select board and the finance committee going forward. So, yeah. The, uh, was the vote unanimous from the uh, finance committee? Yes. Okay, and Randy, you got some. Yes, I would like a, a consensus opinion, whatever you want to call it. Uh, if we get somebody to make a motion to waive the reading of the, every single line item in the budget, uh, I, I, it's my opinion that that makes sense, especially given the outdoors and the heat and the potential for rain to move things along. So I just want to hear anybody's opinion on that. Please. Can that come from the select board or does it have to come from the floor? It can come from anybody. The select board is part of the floor. Yeah, I think we did that thing. last year too, didn't we? I don't remember, John. I don't, I think Amy thought she read, they read stuff, but it just, 
it's so much, it just goes in one out here and in one ear and out the other for most people. So I think it makes sense to just. They yeah. did read mm -hmm. it last year and I would recommend and I would be glad to make that motion. Okay. Yeah, I'll second it then. Okay, so it'll. We'll, any we'll, questions or any line items that need to be pulled out at any point in time, we can do that. Right, well, that's what I'll do, John. I will I will say, you know, uh, we're gonna waive the reading of, if everybody, everybody has to vote for it, it's gotta be a majority vote. And if that's the case, then I'll say, if anybody has any questions about any line item, just speak up. We're not just gonna shut it, shut it down at that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sounds good. Randy, were you looking for a, a vote from finance? No, no, no. Just okay. Just wanted to hear opinions. That's all. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Okay. Can I say that um, maybe we could uh, I, the um, that would go for not just the regular art, um, uh, budget, but the state or um, the water and the sewer. So the next article as well. Sure. Okay. Okay. Any questions on budget before we move on? I don't see any. So I just want to give you the fund balances. The stabilization fund is a million three hundred nine thousand five hundred and thirty-nine. Community Preservation Act is two thousand three hundred and twenty-nine thousand forty-six. Water reserves is one million five hundred and four six thirty-seven. Sewer res reserves is six ninety-one nine zero two. Hadley Media Reserves is 211,414. The Sewer Impact Fund is 35,558. And the Capital Stabilization is 4,689. And I'll ask the question for stabilization. That is, that number there is without our payback that we had pledged to make. That'll be happening in the fall, correct? Uh, Linda can answer that. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that is um, that cap that stabilization account figure is where we started the fiscal year, less the amount uh, that we spent on the FY twenty one budget. So uh, when we put the money back, it'll only it'll increase this amount. Okay. Um, it's your CPA funding is two million, not two thousand or whatever you said at first, Caroline. Oh, I'm sorry. 2,329,046. All right, any other questions on the fund balances? No, but I think people are going to ask the question about, um, is that $10 a permanent fixture in people's water bills for the sewer department? And that is, I. Uh, I'm thinking Susan's on. Susan wants to address that, or Chris. Was that a one-time uh, deal? I and think the sewer impact fund you've had for a while. When did the board vote on that? It was just a couple of months ago. And- um, That was a $40. $10 a quarter. $10, $10 a quarter. And it was voted by the select board to be an infrastructure fee to be used either for water or sewer as the board voted to use it. Oh, I misunderstood that question. Okay. And right now it's towards sewer because that's, as you can see from the numbers, the one that has the issue. And we're also, well, and we're also going to need funds for Route 9, um, the debt for um, the improvements in the infrastructure that we're making on Route 9. Uh, and we're saving a ton of money piggybacking with DOT, so. Correct. Um, but I still would like us to take a look at that, that it not be a permanent thing to subsidize the sewer. I want us to get back to um, having sewer people be responsible for the sewer reserve amount. So we need to take a look at those numbers. And like I said, I, I think you folks already decided that you were going to do that. So right, I just want to reiterate that Susan, that we need to do it. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And that conversation, question? it was only about the forty dollar amount. I, I don't recall any of that ten dollar. 
And I look back on the meetings and I don't see it in there. It was ten dollars per per bill, uh, John. I think you voted for it, John. Yeah. All right. Uh, any other questions on? Yeah. <laughs> yes, he did. Yeah. All right. Um, let's keep going. All right, this is the article to replace the water and sewer lines under Route 9 in tandem with the MassDOT Route 9 widening project. By completing this work during the project, the town will see a significant cost savings. Um, it will be, a, a, uh, it's been estimated that it'll be about a million dollar savings. If we were to do it by ourselves, it would cost a million more. Um, so we are, uh, that is the article, but I am also uh, applying for a Mass Works grant uh, to get reimbursed for that. It was just the timing at this point. Um, we needed to make a commitment before September uh, to MassDOT that we had funding and that uh, the MassWorks grant is not gonna be completed until August. So hopefully this will get reimbursed. Yeah, it's, have you been keeping an eye on that infrastructure money that's supposed to be coming from feds? Because that you should be able to apply this to the, the federal money also at some point. Yeah, it's too it's too early to tell what that bill is going to look like and what it's going to yeah. be targeted to. Yeah, it's not even out yet, but uh, no. I just it's worth keeping an eye on. Absolutely. Okay, next. And this is the Hadley Fire Department is requesting 20,000 to purchase a used amb ambulance and Chief Spike Mabel I know is here so he can address that. Yes, uh, we, we have quite the opportunity. The Northampton Fire Department uh, has an ambulance that they are taking out of service. And uh, we did sign a letter of intent with them based upon funding. Uh, we've had in capital for about 10 years now a request uh, based upon the fire department study and also just the five-year implementation plan of the fire department uh, to bring in a basic level ambulance. Uh, a new ambulance of this of this quality is two hundred and eighty thousand uh, dollars. They are offering it to us for twenty thousand with all the equipment in it, um, and basically. Looking, we, we do have our, this is not replacing our ALS ambulance service that we're under contract right now. Uh, we feel that this, this is an important addition to our department as we're, over the past three years, we've averaged missing approximately 100 to 150 calls that goes to mutual aid and also to our Hadley Action Med 2, which is not part of our contract. Uh, so we would like to try and pick up those calls with our own department members operating this ambulance service. Um, we have the space for it and the revenues would be brought into the community for these calls. And it would also um, continue with the improved response times that we've seen by having our own ambulance in-house. So uh, our average response time is between four and five minutes now uh, compared to what it used to be, uh, which was eight to, eight to 15. So we'd like to continue with that improvement and and bring this this great opportunity to the town. I I believe I'd like to chime in because I, I I've been working on these ambulance committees since I was on the school committee. So that's too damn long if you ask me. Yeah. But anyway, we've been um, really putting this at the forefront that we've always wanted to at least get ourselves into the BLS, uh, which is just a step uh, into moving forward to the ALS. Uh, we have to do BLS for at least a year uh, before you can at, at least apply for the ALS. So um, this is really a step in the right direction for us to sustain. And I think we've proven that in the long run that uh, eventually if we were able to have our own ambulance service, that it would be uh, a benefit to the town and, and also uh, money coming forward for, uh, for the budget and for the department. So that would be my spiel. Bruce, if, if you're going to speak to that, could you say what it is instead of initials? Because I don't think anyone in the audience will know what you're talking about. Certainly. Basic life support. And, and uh, the other is advanced life support. Yeah, I think that will make a big difference instead of just letters. 
I can do I can do it all, Jane. Absolutely. And Randy and Susan both have questions. Who gets to go first? <laughs> go ahead, Rand. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, Mike, year, miles, condition of this vehicle? Yes, this uh, ambulance, it's a 2009 GMC. Uh, it has, you know, it has, it has higher mileage on it, but it's been maintained uh, immaculately. Uh, the, I can tell you that the department does not, uh, the members of the department are sorry to see it go, but their, their capital plan switches out an ambulance basically other, every other year. Um, so it's, it's time. Uh, uh, Brian Washkevitz, our, my lieutenant, who also handles our vehicle, uh, has, has gone through the thing top to bottom. Um, again, they have all their, their maintenance records with it. And this is a great starting ambulance for us. And uh, again, uh, this, they're in the process of building their new ambulance. So we're not looking to receive this until probably late fall. And then we would have to go through our process to put it into service as well. Um, again, uh, this is, this is a great opportunity to get our foot in the door and start bringing in some revenues uh, to support our department. So we're not asking for additional funding. Is it gas or diesel? This is a diesel. So you could also say that, that diesel engines have more of a life than gas engines. You actually just at the number that you're giving me, is just broken in. That's correct. This also includes, just so, just so everybody's aware, this also They've also agreed, agreed to include the power stretcher with it. Um, just so you know, the power stretcher alone, if we were to purchase it new, is mm -hmm. $38,000. So yep. that alone is just, it's, it's certified, it's been tested. They're not giving us something that they're just trying to get rid of, but it's more of a cost for them to try and uh, pull this frame out. And uh, mm -hmm. they're also giving us all the radio equipment. So the radio equipment will be included in this. And... Uh, again, it's extremely clean and they really, they really have a robust uh, system. And just so you know, this has to go through a very strict inspection through the state before it can go into service as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So we wouldn't be taking the chance of that failing uh, for that reason. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, a far cry from the $155,000 we've been paying Amherst for the last 50 years. So. Mm -hmm. this, a, this is a great step in the right direction. And with the amount of equipment included, it's yes. just a bonus. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Any last uh, questions on Article 18? Let's keep going. Okay, article, actually article 20 through 23, I'm going to ask Amy to uh, help me out with this one. Um, they're out of order a little bit, but it does make sense. Uh, it's two different funding sources, but I'm going to let Amy, um, she did such a great job last time, I'm going to let her explain it. Okay, so article, um, there's article 20 is Gerlinski. The next article would be the same thing, except it's Hanrich. Okay, so these are both APR properties and um, basically how it's working is um, on, this a on these APR properties, 90% of the funding is gonna be coming from the state and 10% is gonna be coming to, the, the, to fund it is coming from the town. It's gonna be split into two on the 10%, 5% coming out of the CPA fund and 5% coming <laughs> out of uh, conservation, the TDR fund. So that's why it's split into a couple different articles because it's coming from two different funding sources, but these are both APR uh, properties. It's Grilinski and Hanrich. Okay. Thank you. Well, that's good. And then the next one. She covered the next two, one, two. Yeah. I go pretty fast. Yeah. So steeple oh. clock is yours, Amy. <laughs> uh, Susan has her hand up again, I think, or unless she didn't take it down. I think she forgot to put it down. Okay. All right, let's keep going. Okay, okay. sorry. 
So the steeple clock um, that they're just requesting because it's not working properly, they're constantly having to maintain it. So it has the uh, CPA is looking to fund the 13.5 um, to help repair that clock. It's um, and it's based in, in the uh, it's for historic. It's going to come out of the historic set asides. So um, Edwin, um, on all these articles uh, that we talk about for CPA, um, I'm kind of like the uh, um, second hand here. Um, Edwin really, he would probably be, he would like to and be the best one to discuss all these at town meeting if that is okay. Who's that? Edwin Matusko. Oh, sure. sure. Yes. Sure, that's fine. I'm his backup. Okay. <laughs> All right, any questions on the steeple clock? Let's keep going. Okay, this is the Planning Board River Bylaws. And I think Jim and Bill are still here. Yes, we are. This is uh, the Article 25 is amending the bylaw, the river, river bylaw that is already on the books, but it's bringing it up to present standards with MS4 and a bunch of other stuff. The biggest change to this article is, a, is addressing the um, RVs, for lack of a better term, that are scattered along the, the Hadley shoreline during the summer months. Right now, if you want an RV, you're allowed one per lot, and you're going to go through a special permit um, with a ZBA. This new revised section will allow multiple RVs on the property based on certain criteria, and you will no longer need to go to the ZBA for the special permit. It'll be pretty much by right. The building inspector will be the overseer of this particular section of the bylaw. Now, people are going to say it makes it a lot easier. Well, the conservation currently, the, 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 you must comply with conservation fire department, and other Board of Health rules already. But they haven't been enforced for whatever reason. Um, so anybody that is saying that this new bylaw makes it more difficult because of that, it is a total incorrect. If this bylaw fails, the multiple RVs will not be permitted and you'll go back to one per lot, but you'll still have to comply with conservation, Board of Health, fire department, et cetera. So it is to the advantage if it's a, if it is passed because it'll make it a, I mean, anybody that has an RV, there's a bunch of hoops that they have to jump through um, to get the RVs on the property. Conservation, like I said, and that's going to be the case whether the bylaw fails or not. So it is a an advantage to the town if this thing passes and to the landowners and stuff and it'll make it a more straightforward process to get all these permits. Jim, is that for future owners too, if a land's, piece of land is sold? If the land, I mean, if the land is sold, typically money, well, if the land is sold, depending how it's sold and what the new owners decide, um, the permit is good for three years that the building is the building department will issue. So if the land is sold and they decide they don't want um, the RVs, they don't want the RVs. If they do want RVs, it's a three year permit that they have to renew every three years. But I don't think, can I, uh, Jim? Yes. Um, I don't think that that's, should be correct. I think when the property is sold to somebody else that they need to go through their own permitting process and it doesn't go with the land. It's like the uh, alcohol licenses that doesn't go with the building when the building is sold for or the restaurant is sold. I think that uh, a permit is issued to that person and it's not issued to the future owner if they sell the property. The permit goes to the holders of the, I believe to the holders of the RV. Is that correct though? 
So I'll, uh, I can take a look at that, but that level of, uh, is really something we have left to the building inspector to deal with. Okay. We're, we're trying to get the planning board and the zoning board of appeals, the ZBA out of the river, off the river. <clears throat> so uh, the, the bylaw is intentionally sort of broad and it delegates a lot of authority to the building inspector who, and I'm forgetting the buzzword now, but he's also the uh, floodplain uh, manager. Mm -hmm. All right. I was just assuming that with any license or any um, any type of thing like we do, like I said, with our alcohol licenses, when that building or that land is sold, the alcohol license does not go with that building. They have to apply for that license. I would assume that that would be the same deal if somebody sold their property that they would also have to initiate their own permit for their own RV or whatever they're going to use for the intention of that property. Right. Well, and, and, and again, we are deferring to, uh, to the, the building board. inspector to develop the regulations for the, the day-to-day -day operation. We're not trying to regulate it from a zoning perspective. Okay. All right, what thank Joyce, you. What Joyce is saying makes sense because one of the major reasons for the registration is to be able to notify people. And if we owners, we all sudden don't have anybody to notify. So uh -huh. I think that Tommy should really look at that when he's figuring out his uh, operational system, if you will. Yeah, obviously that is that is a primary concern, knowing who to who to reach out to. But again, we are leaving that level of detail to the building inspector, and we're tr we're trying to strip it out of the zoning bylaw because the zoning bylaw is too clumsy a tool for things like this. Uh mm huh. -hmm. Yeah. Friedman has a question. Yeah, I have a question, Bill. Um, now, if this doesn't pass, it has an impact on national flood insurance program flood maps and how people can insure for flood along the river. Isn't that correct? To, to some extent and to an unknown extent at the moment, um, the, um, everybody's been focusing on RVs along the river, but the first three or four sections of the bylaw talk about development standards along the floodplain, in the floodplain as a whole. And that's what we're really being asked to update. And if we do not update to the standard that the state is setting, and the state is setting a standard based on what the uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is telling the state to do, uh, there is a risk that we may lose eligibility for flood insurance participation uh, in that area. Uh -huh. uh, which, now, would impact, which would impact people with mortgages because mortgage- Correct. Is, you, if you are requiring flood insurance. If you are in a flood zone, you must get flood insurance in order to get a mortgage at whatever the cost may be. So I think it's critical that you say that when we're talking about this article, because that if people haven't been following the meetings as the select board and others have, they'll have no idea why they should care. Yeah, that, 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 those are good points. Andy has a question still. Right. Yes, thank you. Um, you said that uh, if this bylaw passes, people would be able to go from having one RV per site to multiple RV per sites. Uh, did I understand that correctly? And is there a limit to the number of RVs that a person can have at a particular site? There is a limit based on the criteria of so many square feet and so many feet between RVs. And the 100% and the 100 foot setback from the river, correct, Jim? Yeah, that, that but the 100 foot setback applies no matter what, because that's, that's a current right situation with even with existing bylaw. Correct. So yeah, that, that, that will also change things. And if you have more than three RVs um, on the site, more than likely you may be considered a campground under the state guidelines. And now you've got to provide porta potties as opposed to on site, just a regular little uh, 
toilet in your RV. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of other criteria that if you have more than three RV that you're going to have to make it, the Board of Health will get involved if there's three or more RVs. Yeah, I, I think it was 150 feet uh, of frontage on the street side or was it on the river side? The existing, the existing bylaw, I think, is 100 feet, 150 feet of frontage. Does the new bylaw yeah. is basically by the lot. Mm -hmm. okay. And a lot of the lots don't have 150 feet of frontage. Some only have 40 or 50 feet. So right. we, have, we have some lots off of Aquavita Road, for example, and some off of uh, Cemetery Road as well, um, or whatever it turns into after it goes over the dike. Um, you could have a lot that's only 40 feet wide, but is uh, an acre and a half. So, um, yeah, you, you, you'll have, you, you could have multiple campers or multiple RVs on that site, but really at some point it doesn't get as much fun to be the fifth one back um, on a narrow lot. So uh, it's going to be a self-limiting problem uh, situation to some extent anyway. Uh -huh. Randy, go ahead. Jimmy or Bill, uh, you said this permit is good for three years. Do you know if the permit that the Conservation Commission has to grant for this is good for three years or is that good for just one year? My understanding is the Conservation Commission, once they grant their license, um, as long as you ask for a timely renewal of it, you can keep on rolling it over. Okay. But that has nothing to do with the zoning aspects of okay. it. That I understand, but I think that is going to be a big issue at town meeting. So if you guys can explain as best you can that, you know, as Jimmy already said, that's already pre-existing. There's that's right. got nothing to do with this bylaw. I'm going to try to limit the amount of discussion relative to the Conservation Commission because it, it it's not perfect. Yeah, that is definitely out of order to um, anything, any issues that people have with the Conservation Commission are with the Conservation Commission and are separate and apart from the terms of this bylaw. Right. This bylaw never exempted you from, or it, it can't exempt you from compliance with Conservation Commission and Board of Health rules. Right, so if, again, if you guys would, would iterate that that would be awesome and and then hopefully people will hear you and we can move forward yeah that this yeah there there's a lot well it depends i mean a lot of the people that have campers on the river that have been in, that have been involved in our zoom meetings when we discuss this have really settled in that they are content with this bylaw now the mm -hmm. way it's rewritten but we'll see on town meeting floor exactly okay yeah. thanks guys Tommy had something as well. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself or get on here. Um, well, basically, the, the permit is going to be, you know, through the um, landowner. We never did discuss whether if it was sold or transfer. I guess it wouldn't transfer unless it was the exact same campers that were, you know, going to stay there. You know, if one of the campers that was on there, um, you know, just wanted to reapply, we could work something like that up. We didn't, we never really discussed that. But it's the landowner who will, will be pulling the permit. Yeah, that was the only question I had, Tommy. I know it opens up another can of worms, but it's it's probably going to be asked, you know. I I asked it, so I mean, I'm I'm curious because it, evidently, when a building or anything else gets sold, it gets sold. So it actually turns it over to the new buyer to apply for a new permit. And that would make sense as far as if it was the same campers and the year three years weren't up. I mean, I don't see why we couldn't, you know, waive the fee for them and just reissue it under the new owner. But I guess we'll, you know, never really discuss that part of it. Okay. Have to take a look at it because again, you've got a new owner of the property. They're paying the taxes on it. So it reverts back to them as the uh, responsible person for that piece of property. So they would have to apply for a permit as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Yes, yeah, so it would just be whether we it's the same people, it'd be nice to be able to waive the fee and, and just give them the permit. Well, it won't be the same people. The person now that's applying for the permit is paying the fee, It'd not the new, camper. Yeah, so when, that, when the property is sold, it's the new person applying for the, the owner of the property 
needs to pay another fee because he is now the new owner of the property and the, where the taxes go. And, and what the what the bylaw does is give Tom the authority to make those rules and rulings. Okay. Tom, um, when somebody applies for a, a permit, let's say I own the land and you want to put a trailer on it and Bill Dwyer wants to put a trailer on it and David Field, do you each get a permit specifically to you or are they all issued to me? They'll all be issued to the individual person. You know, the it's a special permit trailer. given to each to each camp, right, each RV, but we the applicant will be the owner that, you know, puts in for the individual you know, after they've gone through conservation and, and they're allowed to be in that in that location. Okay. So I, um, Mr. Chungle, as you say, it, I, I understand, totally agree. I, I guess I was just trying to say if, if um, those three people owned it, I mean, had three campers there, you know, is whether, why would, you know, if we could waive not having them to pay if the same three people were staying there, just issue a whole new permit. Um, yeah. You know, the same family, I guess, if just change members of family or something like that. Fam okay. Family, mem yeah, family members is different. So I agree. Yeah. Now I, I will, you know, it's up to your discretion, Tom. How you how you do it? It's it's your ball. Roll it. <laughs> <laughs> you can have it. <laughs> That's what we said. <laughs> I think it is important to mention too that there was a committee that was set up for this, and there were members <laughs> that participated in the, uh, I guess, the formation of this bylaw. So they were consulted, and I believe pretty much universally this, this was considered an, an improvement over what uh, the existing bylaw was. Okay, perfect. All right. That's the feedback we have, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. If there's no other questions, let's go to 26. Okay. Uh, this article seeks to change the official date of the annual town election from the second Tuesday of April before town meeting to the third Tuesday in May of each year after town meeting. And if you remember our non-binding referendum question was on the annual town election and it was yes, 339 and no, 112. Okay, any questions on this? No. Nope. I'll make a comment. I think it's a great idea because typically the way things work like, for instance, we have a new select person who gets two weeks to figure out everything before town meeting. So I think it's better to have, uh, you know, 11 and a half months to get ready for town meeting than two weeks. Yeah, I, I have stuff I can say pros and cons for it on the floor of the meeting if necessary. Okay. All right, anything else for the articles? Uh, anything else you wanna hit, Randy, before we move on? Oh, I'm sorry, we forgot 28. Parking ban. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's basically just saying what, what it says there, that there we will be doing a winter parking ban, uh, which will allow no parking uh, at any time on the streets from December 1st to April, for, uh, April 1st. So we've always just uh, had it brought before us, but we're just making a bylaw saying that this is a, this is a law that's going to take place. So, Chief Mason's on here. Chief, did you want to chime in on this or are you good? Um, no, Joyce, uh, Joyce did a good job. I mean, the only thing I would say is that the way we do it right now is really kind of clunky. Um, and to be honest with you, uh, this makes a little bit more sense for members of the public because they'll know when they can't park in the street now. Right now, Chris Okafor calls the select board and says, we need a parking ban for this snowstorm. The select board deems it necessary. And unless folks are, you know, watching the, uh, the Hadley, town of Hadley website during snowstorms, they really don't know that this is occurring. Uh, it doesn't change anything for the police department. We're still going to knock on doors, try to find the folks whose cars are parked there. We're not just going to be towing people indiscriminately. Uh, this just makes it uh, a better process. And pretty much every town around us has one. So we should actually um, hopefully send out notices to businesses that do have their customers uh, park on side streets that they can no longer do that from December 1st to April 1st. Um, and that's just going to be a standard thing for them. They'll have to readjust their parking um, 
to accommodate their customers. Randy? Ka-ching, ka-ching. So are you, is this saying that there is no parking at all or only on a snow emergency? At all. That's not what that says to me. Oh, so that that you can park there as long as you don't impede snow removal or emergency service functions. Well, how do you know you're not going to? Well, that's the that's the fun stuff, Joyce, that you get into in situations <laughs> like this. Somebody's going to say, there's only two inches of snow. I'm not impeding any issues. So that might be, I mean, and talk to Chief Mason and see if it makes sense, but well, Randy, the the reason that the reason that we wrote it this way is, is specifically because I found this type of language in several other bylaws, and I think the reason that they probably use it is to indicate that the reasoning behind it is for snow removal operations. It's not, you know, for Fourth of July fireworks or something like that. Obviously, the time 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 of the year denotes that, but. I think uh, the reason that the, the select board decided to go with this language as opposed to some others is just to show people that it's for snow, that the plow trucks need to be able to get through. So okay. I'll go I, to I get that, but I, I also know, you know, one of the big uh, culprits of this, and I'm not going to mention names, uh, but there, there, I'm sure that if it's a, you have a beautiful week between December 1st and April 1st, and it's not going to snow, there's going to be people parking on the side of the street. So that's just my two cents. I guess we'll so, see what so happens. This, this, go the, bylaw, the bylaw gives a, gives a, a trigger. It, it, allows, uh, it allows an enforcement option. Uh, if we cannot find the owner of a car to get it moved, it allows the enforcement to tow it if we can't find this person. It, changes, it does not change the way that we do things. And there's no reason for us to be looking for cars parked on the side of the road on a beautiful week in December, uh, except for snow operations. If somebody at town meeting can think of one, I guess I'll have to come. Up <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it is explicit there. It says, provided that no parking is allowed at any time on the Hadley Street from December to April 1st. And that shall include areas immediately adjacent to an uh, on street parking, which would otherwise impede snow removal. So it does say no parking. So I mean, it doesn't it doesn't say whether there's snow or not. It just says you can't park from December first to April first. So um, yeah. yeah. So okay. I'm gonna I'll let it go because I'm gonna agree to disagree. But okay. Uh, a quick background on this is uh, during uh, a couple of the snowstorms this last winter we realized that we didn't have a bylaw on the books, even though we've had signs at the town borders uh, for who knows how long saying that we do have this bylaw. So uh, we searched through, David Nixon helped to search and we could not find any votes that actually put this bylaw in a, into effect. Everyone seems to remember it, but we couldn't find any record of it. So it was time to uh, make the bylaw match the signs that have been in place forever. Uh, I'm not against it. Don't get me wrong. I just, no, no, I'm just think yeah. that it, uh, it can get you get into some trouble, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Andy Morris Friedman had a question. Oh, thank you. I, I withdraw it. Okay. And then uh, Susan, you had a question as well, or was it answered? Actually, it wasn't about uh, this article. It was about article 27. Can we do that in the consent agenda to change a term? of an uh, appointed individual? I think we can do anything in the consent agenda that we want to that doesn't require two thirds. I'm not positive, but I believe. I, I'm worried about it because that would, as you're the appointing authority for the finance committee, that could move things. Um, oh. I, I, I'm just questioning it. I, I'm throwing it out there. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we can have Carolyn check with the town council to make sure it's not going to be a problem. I, I'm here um, as luck would have it. It's Jeff Blake from KP. Um, <laughs> I, I think Mr. Moderator is correct. You, we could put anything we want in the consent agenda. Um, 
And you could actually put in the consent agenda something that would require a two thirds vote, but then every single other um, article would require the two thirds vote. So that's what I'm concerned about. Yeah. Yeah, but but there's no two thirds vote here, and if the town wants to vote a block of um, a block of uh, articles as a consent agenda, they absolutely can do it. Okay, Thank you, sir. I thought we talked about it. Wanted to leave it out separate because we put it on uh, the ballot, and then we'll give people time to decide on what they want to do with it at town meeting. I mean, the referendum was overwhelming, but that wasn't for this. Yeah, that wasn't for this. That was a different oh, issue, hard. and it can get pulled if if somebody wants to pull it out and talk about it. They can. I'm just trying to speed things up and get us out of there. I know, Randy. <laughs> All right. Did we miss any? Anything else we got to hit? I've got a couple of questions I want to ask the select board before you close this down. Sure. Are there? Are you guys giving any awards out? Yes, that was going to be on my list. We have dedications to uh, David Nixon and Martha Boysworth that I wanted to volunteer for if no one else did. And then we also have the uh, Spank Mabel uh, kids um i would like that choice. okay so you're just going to have a dedication of that stuff all right are you going to do a uh, state of the town david uh no in the interest of time i don't think so okay all right and all right that's so that's it those three dedications david didn't you wasn't it supposed to be uh, martha and uh, Janine Giles. Uh, Jennifer, what did we end up voting on? No, it was David Nixon. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. It was David Nixon and Martha Boysford. Okay. I think, I'm, I think I made a motion that it in my, in memoriam to be with Martha and Janine, but yeah, I wrote it down with David Nixon and Martha Boysford. I'm really sorry. Um, the town report is most assuredly at the printers. Okay. Being delivered tomorrow. So right, we'll um, catch up for, we'll catch up and maybe do something in the fall. Okay. Okay. Sounds like good. Um, Andy, do you, did you have another question or is your hand still up from before? Uh, no, I have two quick questions. One is what the, um, um, the quorum numbers will be. Do we still need a hundred people? Uh, yeah. And also, I have a question about the sound system. At last town meeting, anyone outside of the garage couldn't hear. Um, will there be a, a sound system so, so people can, can hear? So mm -hmm. I'll answer those. The quorum is still 100. And when we did this last year at, at the Hopkins Field, there was no issues with people not being able to hear. So I'm assuming it's going to be the same outstanding setup that it was last year. It was, it was a whole different animal at the safety complex, Andy. And I agree with you, that was terrible. Uh, but this worked out much better at the fields. Okay, great, thank you. Anything else, Randy? No, I think I'm good. We're gonna meet before town meeting, correct? Mm -hmm. In the hot, sweltering sun, yes. We're no, we're not. <laughs> we can meet here. Boys, <laughs> you love the beach. <laughs> I, I do, but I don't like not being at the beach. <laughs> you got a beach meeting? breeze, you know. <laughs> Are we meeting upstairs or downstairs at Town Hall? Upstairs. Either. I thought we were just going to meet outside. We don't meet inside. Yeah, we meet on the front porch. Yeah, we there's, can. A, there's a beautiful ocean view from the front porch. <laughs> oh, you're dreaming. <laughs> Gotta fool you somehow, Joyce. I know, I know. I'll keep that thought in my mind. It might be rain. We asked for the water fountain to be running too a couple of years ago. You know, you don't no. hear the, the water flowing, you know. What happened to that with the water department? Where did that go? I don't know. That one in a common I know we talked about too. Yeah, well we'll we'll get to it. Jennifer, did you have something else? Yep. Um the collector 
um, was asking that we do a reminder that fourth quarter water and sewer bills are due on June 1st. Um, you can make them in person, drop them off, mm -hmm. mail them, or online. Perfect. And uh, let's see, any, before we do announcements, Jeff, are you here for an executive with us or are you here just for the forum? I was here just for the forum. If you want me to stay for the executive, happy to. I'm not staying for no executive. Where did you come up with yeah. that? Well, we posted for it in case we needed it, but I didn't think we needed it. But I figured I'd ask Jeff since we, he was here. So we'll no, I, it. I, I have no further. Uh, nothing else has happened in that matter. Okay. All right. So no executive session. So then uh, any announcements before we adjourn? I don't tonight. All right. Oh, yes. Yes. We do have one. I want to uh, wish all of our public safety, um, our police, our fire, our emergency services, our ambulance. Uh, it's National Week for Public Safety. And um, I just want to say a, a big thank you to everyone that does work for um, our safety in this town, that they do an outstanding job and really appreciate everyone. Susan? Uh, just thoughts and prayers for Scott Ring and his family. Scott Ring? Yep. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Last call for announcements. If I could get a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. You made it, Joyce. I got it. <laughs> All right. Motion Second. By Jane, second by Jane. And uh, if I could get a roll call, Jennifer. Roll call, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Skevitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. We'll see you on Saturday. <laughs>